Dear colleagues, I am also very happy to welcome you to this online introductory course that we run with Joseph Chocron. Until we can travel and meet each other in person, it is my pleasure to present you the clinical result of all the biological principles that Joseph has been presenting to you. I am Jerome Sarmanian and I'm here to talk about the overall concept with PRF and the osteoimmunology revisited, the clinical evaluation. So before we start, who am I? So I'm Jerome, I have a Master of Science in Oral Biology. I have a postgraduate in Periodontology and Implantology from Boston University. I also have a postdoc in Osteoimmunology from a laboratory in Nice. I'm a past clinical professor at the University of Nice. And uh, for many years now, I have a private practice in bone reconstruction and implantology. So what's my practice? 15 years ago, my practice was 100% autogenous bone. 10 years ago, we introduced allogenic bone and PRF. And so we completely stopped the autogenous bone, which uh, was at that time completely uh, nonsense to not use autogenous bone in a full uh, practice that is dedicated to bone reconstruction. So basically, we started from this, bone harvesting in the posterior mandible, uh, and the time that it requires, and the skills that it requires, to doing vertical augmentation using a T-mesh and a sticky bone. You have seen this slide with uh, Joseph Chocron's presentation. So the importance of the immune supplementation, the vitamin D, the importance of using a non-inflammatory xenograft, like Purgo, the ovaries of the soft tissue, which is the clinical part that we'll be talking about, how we take care of the soft tissue, how we manage the tension, the pressure, and in the end, how we do the sutures. Because the sutures, it's not only closing the wound. There is a specific way of uh, suturing the, the flaps in order to get a wonderful healing. So let's see now the clinical application of the over concept, how we do it. So what we've been doing for years, it's the over concept. It starts with the over supplementation that Joseph's been talking about, over supplementation of vitamin D and also some other, other supplements. The over space that we will create uh, using the FAST system, the titanium mesh or the screws, we'll get into a lot of details in the following slides. The overstimulation using the PRF to increase the angiogenesis. The over release of the soft tissue, like we've just said before, the soft tissue, it's not to release just enough to close. You will see that the over release, we need to release a lot more to put the bone graft in a comfortable situation and the over stability with the sutures, as just said previously, uh, we do not suture only to close the wound, but we suture to uh, stabilize the periosteum and to stabilize the flap onto the bone graft that we are uh, doing. So let's start with the over supplementation. You need a lot of vitamin D, that was the message of Joseph. Not just 30 nanograms per milliliter. How much do you need? Well, we target 50 to 70 nanograms per milliliter and uh, we owe this work to uh, Elisa Shukron. Now the bone grafting. In order to get a fast revascularization of the bone graft, you need to avoid the pressure from the soft tissue. So this is called protective bone regeneration. Many ways to, uh, to achieve a protective bone regeneration. You can do the cortical bone plate, the Curis technique, which is wonderful, but it needs a second surgical site. You need to take a bone block. You need to split it into, you need to adjust the screws. So it needs some time. And uh, also, uh, there is the, an increased morbidity because of a donor site. You can use PTFE non-resorbable membranes. Yes, it gives wonderful results, but again, you need some time to adjust the membrane to the site, to secure it uh, on the buckle, and to secure it on the link wall, which is much more challenging because of the access. You can use a titanium mesh, the custom-made titanium mesh, quite convenient, but uh, very expensive to use and not so easy to use practically. And in the end, this is the FAST system that Joseph invented a couple of years ago, and I was happy uh, to be able to play with it almost 10 years ago now. So the FAST system, basically, it is a titanium mesh that is secured by two screws. But the FAST system is also completed by a screw tenting, which means that sometimes we can only just use some screws to maintain the space. So concept selection, how do you select your concept? There is only one concept. The concept is no pressure. So look at this case. We have two bone blocks. We have another cortical lamella, which is a curry technique. And also, like you see here, just one screw. 
all three techniques work? Yes, of course they work, but how, how much time does it require? How much skills does it take you to harvest the bone block, to secure it? To harvest the bone block, to split the, the spongiosa, and to secure the cortical plate at distance of the recipient site, compared to simply using a screw and placing a screw from the fast system. So this is the case, you can see the biomaterials that is uh, injected all around the bone. So let's see the healing. So this is the healing after four months. The result is wonderful, yes. But it is also wonderful at the area of the, just the screw, not only the cortical plate, not only uh, the bone blocks. So all these uh, concepts, they are protective bone regeneration, and we target at using the most simple and efficient way of doing this protective bone regeneration technique. So what is the FAST system? It is using screws or a titanium mesh to protect the bone graft from pressure. Usually we like to use the screws to augment horizontally and we prefer to use the titanium mesh for the vertical augmentation. It is fast, it is easy and it is convenient to use. So basically for space maintenance, what do you use? The screw, the mesh? So when it's horizontal, I told you, it's, we have a preference towards the use of the screws for the horizontal augmentation. For vertical augmentation, we prefer to use the titanium mesh. But of course, you can use the mesh for horizontal augmentation and you can use the screw for vertical, but it is more convenient and much faster to use the screws for horizontal and for the vertical, the titanium mesh. But there is some rules uh, on uh, how you place the screws and we'll be discussing this in the coming slides. So the screw tenting as you can see on this diagram and on the x-ray, what you see is that the screw protects from the stress of the soft tissue. So the screw tenting, it is the most simple way to create a, a space that is free of pressure. So it is, like I've just said, ideal for a horizontal augmentation, like you see on this case. This case, for instance, it's a horizontal defect, quite severe, because this patient had a trauma. And uh, look how the screws are positioned they are positioned deep in the buckle, they have a specific angulation that I will be giving you in the next slide. Look at the x-ray, and this is the result after four months. So some rules apply, how to position the screws. You do not position the screw uh, without a good uh, positioning technique. So first you need to determine the volume to create. Then you need to draw two lines, vertical and horizontal. And at the edge of this theoretical volume, this is where there is the most pressure from the soft tissue. Most often, the axis of the screw is 45 degrees. So how to position the screw? Not like this. This is wrong. This is right. You draw the two lines, you position your screw, and yes, this is the proper way of positioning the screw. Everything has its importance. It's not just placing screws how it feels. It's placing screws where it needs to be placed because at this crossing of these two lines, this is where there is the most pressure from the flap. So protective bone regeneration, it means that the regeneration follows the angulation of the screws. And so going back to the previous slide, it means there is a proper way of positioning the screw in order to achieve a perfect bone regeneration. These are examples of optimal screw angulation. And what do you observe? You observe that the screw position, it determines the angulation uh, and the regeneration of the bone. So it's not just taking some screws and placing them, you need to place them in the proper angulation. And usually, it is around 45 degrees. Regarding vertical augmentation, the titanium mesh, it is the most efficient system to protect from the vertical pressure. Go back to the posterior mandible. Where does the pressure come from the most? It comes from the vertical. It is the vertical pressure. So that's why we are using a very stiff titanium mesh. How do you position the mesh? Well, you need to adjust the mesh at the height of the bone of the last tooth. Which brings me to a detail. If the last tooth has a very low height of bone, 
then you might need to sacrifice the tooth because you cannot grow vertically bone above the height of the, la the la last adjacent tooth. So you need to adjust the mesh at the height of the bone of the last tooth. Second rule, the mesh needs to run posteriorly in buccal direction. So anteriorly, close to the last tooth, the mesh is in lingual position and then it runs posteriorly in the buccal direction. So some rules for stabilizing the mesh. So since the mesh runs from the bone, the height of bone of the last tooth, and it goes to the bone in the most posterior part, you need a short screw at each extremity because the mesh lies on the bone. So usually with a fast system, we need three to five millimeter uh, length of screw, which is far enough to stabilize the mesh. But what happens if you have a long mesh, like instant in this case that you are seeing just now? You need an extra screw. Why you need this extra screw? Because you need to increase the stiffness of the mesh. And uh, usually our rule is that we put a screw every five holes. If you do not have a stiff mesh, then you might have troubles uh, with your bone regeneration. Now we move on to the overstimulation, the PRF. All my cases for more than 10 years, they are all covered with PRF membranes. And the role of these PRF membranes is to stimulate the healing, it's to improve the angiogenesis. We also use PRF plugs because we want, we, sometimes we cannot close the, socket, the extraction socket. So what do we do? We use a PRF plug that we can suture to help us to close and, uh, the extraction socket. And so it makes much less traumatic extraction. Finally, and uh, like Joseph said in the previous uh, presentation, 100% of my case using uh, pure gold graft is made using a sticky bone. All of these cases are treated with a sticky bone and nothing else. So what is the interest of the sticky bone? I will not get too much into the details because Joseph's been talking about it, but the idea is to decrease the space between the granules and to stick them. And so you can see the maestro Joseph preparing this uh, sticky bone and you can appreciate how he's compacting the sticky bone on the table to decrease the space between the granules. And if you remember the histological section Joseph showed you, why there is much less connective tissue is because we do not leave an open space for the connective tissue to grow there. In most cases, we incorporate metronidazole and uh, azithromycin. We incorporate it uh, the reason is uh, because of the immune effect of the azithromycin and we incorporate it when the sticky bone is already uh, compacted. And so you can see Joseph that is uh, adding the azithromycin and metronidazole at the end when the, when the sticky bone is already uh, ready for use. So now let's talk about biomaterial. So in my practice I've been using autograft and holograft for 15 years. We observed volume contraction over the years. So what happens if you have a volume loss? Well, the answer is everywhere in the literature. You need to add a xenograft. The question comes to which xenograft? So why we decided to incorporate porcine material? Well, reason number one, the antigenic structure is close to human. If the xenograft is sintered, then it means it's long resolvable. It will help us to maintain the volume. The porosity is close to human. So moving towards the graft was a logical move. It was nothing else than a logical move. So all the cases that you will see, they are grafted with a sticky bone made with pure gold graft. But I am quite difficult to convince. So how we incorporated the graft? First, it started with a 50% allograft, 50% pure gold graft. Then we observed it worked very well. The volume was well maintained. So what did we do? We switched to 75% pure gold, 25% allograft. And now I can say that we use 100% of pure gold in our cases. It is interesting to notice that, the PR, the, that with PRF, combined with PRF, the graft 
behaves like a allogenic bone. Let's talk about soft tissue, more clinical stuff, the over-release. In biology, uh, comfort is mandatory. You have seen these uh, ideas with Joseph that he's developed the concept of no pressure, no tension. In biology, comfort is mandatory. So if you compare these two pictures, of course one is much nicer to watch, but you need to bring comfort. So the same principles, they must be applied to the bone. Which means that the soft tissue release must be performed in excess. If you remember, when we started this presentation, I told you, the soft tissue release, it's not just to close and cover the wound. It's not enough. It must be in excess, so it is not going to bring some stress on the bone graft. So, the sole condition to remove the stress from the soft tissue is to leave the graft in a comfortable area. Look at this case. Vertical augmentation, 8 mm. And at the end, you do not reach the stage of the sutures wondering, is it going to close, yes or no? Of course you know that it's going to close because you have released far much more than necessary. You need to leave the graft in a comfortable area. This is the message of the soft tissue release. So to remain physiological, keep in mind, over-release. We have three examples, anterior maxilla, posterior maxilla, posterior mandible, a lot of release. Leave the graft in comfortable area. Do not think, just close the wound. This is a terrible mistake. So after the deep sutures, and I will show you uh, technically how we do it, there should not be any tension for the final closure. You release a lot, you do the deep sutures, so on the crest it's going to be very simple to close and there is going to be absolutely no tension. Joseph invented the soft brushing uh, some years ago and this is how we do it technically. You do an incision on the crest, you elevate a full thickness flap and then you take the brushing instruments and you brush from apical to coronal. This is the movement, brush from apical to coronal on the whole length of the flap. You can see that we brush parallel to the flap. So that's why the angulated instruments exist. We like to brush parallel to the flap. We want to release the soft tissue, but we do not want to hurt the soft tissue. So this is the message of soft brushing. Brush from apical to coronal and brush also parallel to the, uh, to the flap. So this is the case you've just seen, and this is the release. What you observe? No bleeding. You have a full release on the whole length of the flap. Not just the posterior part, but also the anterior part where you have the mental foramen. No bleeding, full release, and we do no incision in most cases. Question, is it always enough? Can we do everything by using the soft brushing technique? The answer is no. It's insufficient in some cases. If you do a major augmentation or if you have a fibrotic periosteum, it is insufficient, then we need to do a microcut. And I'm happy to show you how we do it now. So technically it's the same thing. Incision on the crest, full thickness flap beyond the mucogengival junction. You keep the flap in tension, reflect it with the bucket tweezers. And with a new 15 blade, you make a small incision. It's like a notch that you are doing in the flap. This way, through this notch, you can insert the um, soft brushing instrument and you can brush the flap. So you've done the notch. You take the brushing instruments. Again, you can notice that uh, I am using an angulated uh, soft brushing instrument because I want to brush parallel to the flap. I do not want to damage the, the flap when I'm getting all my release. So this is how we do. We do a full thickness flap, we do the brushing technique. If we are facing a peri a fibrotic periosteum, then we do a microcut to make a notch. Through this notch, we take the instruments and we brush to separate the layers of the tissue of the flap. But keep in mind, always brush parallel to the flap. 
this brushing must be done with finesse. What about the lingual brush? The protocol for the lingual brush. It always starts the same way. An incision on the crest. A full thickness flap down to the internal oblique line. Then, the brushing starts from the internal oblique line up to the lingual flap, like you can see on the, on the screen. Again, we are brushing the accessory muscle fibers of the milohydian muscle. So you need to brush parallel to the muscle fibers. You do not want to damage the muscle fibers. The idea is to separate the muscle fibers from the lingual flap. So let's see, on the plastic model, you see the instrument is angulated, you see it's somehow full thickness flap. With the back heat tweezers, you keep the flap in tension, and you brush, you make this apical to coronal movement. Let's see on a real patient. You see the Dubaki tweezers maintaining the flap in tension and you brush parallel to the muscle fibers. So it takes usually one minute or so to get the release from the lingual flap. It is a very safe procedure because the instruments are non-cutting instruments, so you're not going to cut anything. Basically, you are stretching the muscle fibers to separate them from the lingual flap. So, dear colleagues, this picture is to show you that when we talk about over-release with Joseph, we mean it. It's not, uh, it's not just words. You need to have far more than necessary to leave the bone graft in a comfortable situation. You do not reach the, the end wondering, is it going to close, yes or no. You know it's going to close because you have a lot more than necessary. This is the over-release. This is the message that we would like to share with you today regarding the soft tissue management. Now let's talk sutures. The sutures goes into the overstability because the suture, it's not just obtaining a primary closure. It's not enough for a bone graft. With the sutures, you want to completely stabilize your flap onto the bone so the flap doesn't get mobile. When there is muscle activity, your, your flap is not moving, it's not compressing, it's not mobilizing your bone graft. So, to, get the, to reach the overstability, we use uh, apical mattress sutures that I will give you the details now. And uh, the sutures type that we use is uh, monofilament, resorbable, because we do not want to go back in there and have to remove the sutures. This apical mattress suture needs to be done deep in the vestibule. One centimeter minimum from the edge of the crest. Doesn't need to go very deep in the palate, it needs to go deep in the buckle because the idea of the apical mattress is to stop the muscle activity in the buckle. There is no muscle activity that we can control on the palatal side. So we come back from the palatal side and we go back deep in the buckle from inside to outside. This, this suture is the only one that is allowed, that is mandatory, that needs to be strongly tightened. Keep in mind, it is designed, it is invented by Joseph some 10 years ago to shut off the muscle activity around the bone graft area. So this suture needs to be tight, needs to be tightened strongly. So let me show you another case. This is a vertical augmentation close to one centimeter in the anterior maxilla. So how many apical mattress do you do? You do as many as necessary. Uh, you can do around the teeth also, it is very important. You see how deep it is in the buckle. You see how strong it is tightened. Look at the result. Look, when you pull the lip, you see there is no pressure there is no muscular activity onto the bone graft. It is completely stopped by this uh, type of sutures. So no pressure from the soft tissue. Periosteum stabilization. You are helping clearly the periosteum to reattach onto the bone. Obviously, you have a total passive closure on the crest. When this patient comes back in two weeks after the graft, you know there is no reopening. It cannot be because 
there is so much so much uh, flap release. There is the flap stabilization uh, because of the apical mattress. Nothing can happen. Nothing can happen. So you need to check the sutures, like in the previous video. No mobility, it means no ischemia. So we test. You see we did an augmentation on these two missing laterals. See how on this side, when we pull the cheek, when we pull the lip, it's moving. It means it is not done properly. Either it is not too deep, either it is not uh, strongly tightened enough. So no mobility means ischemia because if you elevate a flap, it takes 45 days for the periosteum to get back to a significant function, which means uh, helping to bring blood uh, vessels to the, to the bone. When you stabilize the periosteum, you are helping the periosteum to become functional again and also in a shorter amount of time. What about the crystal suture? Because we talked about the um, we talked about the apical mattress deep in the buccal. For the crest, we always do a continuous uh, interlocking suture. We use 5-0 uh, monofilament again, and uh, we like to use it because there is not many knots, because each knot is a source of pressure on the soft tissue. So the trick of using the continuous lock suture is, your, is the assistant, as you can see, she's keeping the, the thread in anterior position, she's keeping it in tension, then the casuaviero goes inside the loop. Then she takes again the thread, she keeps the thread in tension, we make a circular movement with the casuaviero, then the casuaviero goes into the loop. And again, and so on, and so on. But the idea of this suture is to make a space of five millimeters between each, uh, each uh, each time the needle goes into the soft tissue. So the sutures, they should not be too close to each other. It is very important to, uh, to keep in mind regarding the continuous locking uh, suture. And now the buccal incision. You mean, I mean, Joseph means that the ovaries and the apical mattress is not enough. How is that possible? Look at this picture. Look more closer this picture. What do you see? You see that above the apical mattress sutures, there is tension that remains. There is tension there. Remember the first slides we said we fight pressure and tension. This tension is not good for the healing. So we are going to take care of it. So if the incision seems unavoidable, for example, this case, it's horizontal augmentation and uh, there is no vestibulum, and uh, we are suturing the lip, almost the lip, to, uh, to cover our surgical site. We need to inject an anesthetic dose a few minutes before the incision that we will do in the buckle. And the idea of doing this um, injection just before the incision is to have a vasoconstrictor effect of the anesthesia so it doesn't bleed too much. So we do the injection just a little bit, just to have the... Um, vasoconstrictor effect of the anesthesia. Then I'll show you the sutures in uh, accelerated uh, motion because it's not uh, the point of this video, but this patient was treated this way. Apical mattress deep in the vestibule, uh, continuous interlocking suture in the, on the crest. Look how we are managing the tension in this patient. We do a very superficial incision above the apical mattress sutures. And this is going to relieve the pain from the patient because what hurts the patient is the tension. When you do this, even if it seems un un understandable, you decrease the tension, so you decrease the pain that is going to be uh, felt by the patient after the procedure. And this is a very important, important step. Look at the healing after three months. And after three months, we reopen. Look at the bone volume. If you do not do uh, an apical mattress suture, if you do not do a buccal incision, you are going to have a lot of stress from the soft tissue on the bone graft. You will never get uh, this, uh, this amount of bone, uh, specifically in three months. So let's see some clinical cases of the overall concept. I will show you some cases of extraction and grafting. 
some cases of extraction plus implant plus grafting. Some cases of horizontal augmentation, posterior mandible, anterior maxilla, some vertical augmentations, posterior mandible, anterior maxilla in every site. I want to show you the clinical cases that we do using the over concept combined with PRF and osteoimmunology. And at the end, I will um, go through with you uh, through a full maxilla reconstruction. So the most simple case, extraction grafting. Is it always that simple? I don't think so. This case, the, there is a major infection. You can see that there is the socket, the first socket was very infected and there was uh, also some granulomatous tissue next to it. This is what uh, you can see uh, here. Initially, this, uh, this is not a socket, the socket is here. Here is the extension of the bone destruction. We made a sticky bone with the pure go, the graft. We compact it well on the side. You can see there is no flap, or almost no flap. The flap was only reflected so I can visualize, so I can see the defect, and so I am sure at 100% that the site is clean. Then we put some PRF. There is no closure, as you can see uh, on the clinical picture. What is the point of getting no closure? Well, you do not bring the stress from the soft tissue onto your bone graft. So if you can avoid the closure, it's much better. And this is what the PRF is helping you. Let's see the result at three months. Three months you reopen. Look at the bone volume. Look how healthy looks the bone. Can you tell there was a bone graft? In three months, almost, you can say, you can't say, you can't tell the difference between what you grafted or not. And you maintain the volume because you do not get pressure tension from the soft tissue. So the message of this case, it's important that if you can avoid closing, don't close. But you need to use then PRF layers to help you not close the case. Another case, extraction and grafting, no implant. Look at the defect. So we raise the flap in the buckle. Uh, because again, there is a big defect here and I want to make sure that I can see the defect. I can say at 100% it's clean. There is no more uh, inflamma inflammatory or fibrotic tissue that I left. I want to be sure that everything has been removed and clean. By the way, technically how we clean it, we do not just use um, spatula to clean the, the socket. We use um, a diamond rumber on the surgical uh, handpiece and we go clean the bone with this uh, round diamond burr to make sure everything is clean. Then compact it with a sticky bone of pure gold. And again, it's not closed. I don't want to close it. I, it's a big defect on the back hole. I don't want to close it. I want to uh, avoid the pressure from the soft tissue. So what you see here is a collagen uh, sponge. That is, it's not a collagen membrane. It's a collagen sponge that is covered with um, PRF membranes. So this is after three months. Look at the health of the bone. Look how the bone is. Look at also the volume. This is after three years of function. And look at the soft tissue after three years. We see a lot of people now on the network or in the publication, they want to maintain uh, using socket seal to maintain uh, the volume around the tooth, but you can maintain it also just by avoiding uh, closing the site when you do a bone graft. Sometimes we can place the implant, of course. Each time, and this is our philosophy, each time we are able to place the implant and stabilize it in the proper position, proper angulation, no compromise, then we will place the implant and graft the case, and most of the time without closure. What will be the difference when we do extraction grafting implant with closure or without closure, we do with closure when we add another surgery. For example, we do a sinus lift. For example, we do uh, an apicoectomy on the adjacent tooth. Then we will do the closure. Otherwise, each time we can, it's a simple extraction, no closure. Look at this case. Extraction, place the implant, use pure gold sticky bone, use the PRF membranes to seal the socket to make sure it stays clean. Look at the healing after seven days. 
What does this image bring to you? This image brings some messages. It brings soft tissue health. Why? Because of the immune capacity of the material you are using. It did not create a bad immune response. Why do you have a good response? Because also you are using PRF. You are helping, you are feeding the zone with the cytokines. You are helping the zone to have a good angiogenesis. And this is after two months when the case is ready to go back to the referring colleague to make uh, the prosthetic part. Another case without closure. So we need to extract these two molars. You see the recession on the palatal side. So how do you even close the palatal side? If you're able to place the implant, how are you going to move the palatal flap? So follow our philosophy, place the two implants, place the pure ghost sticky bone, place the PRF membranes. You see, because of this, there is no flap. Because of this, there is no uh, tension on the flap. There is no tension on the suture. The sutures, they are just designed here. They're just made here to stabilize the PRF around the two implants. Look at the healing after one month. Perfect health, perfect health statue. Message of this case, did you make a good service to the patient? In one surgery, you bring back the bone, you have the soft tissue, without being tra traumatizing, without even lifting a flap, just by thinking biology. Now some cases with closure. Like I told you, when I do a closure, it's because I do the extraction, I put the implant, I graft, maybe I do a sinus lift, which is the following case. So this case, extraction, place two implants, do a sinus lift, it was a lateral wall sinus lift, graft with pure go in sticky bone, cover with beautiful PRF membranes, you can see here, look after 2.5 months, the reopening. Look how amazing, you look at the health of the bone, look how healthy it covered the implants. You need to dig to find the, the implant. Another case. Extraction. We did a flap. We did a big flap because there was huge cyst. And what we did is clean it very well, put the implant. We did an apicoectomy on the posterior tooth. Yes, we can discuss, can we, should we keep this posterior tooth? The patient wants to try anything possible to try to save the tooth. So uh, we did an apicoectomy with a retro filling with MTA. We placed the implant, placed the pure ghost sticky bone. We packed layers of PRF membrane. And this is the result after two months. Dear colleagues, after two months, look how the bone is healing. Look, you don't see the granules anymore. You have a perfect health, health of the bone. Perfect regeneration in only two months. Another case where I did a big flap and a closure uh, because it's an anterior maxilla, it's multiple extraction, it's uh, big augmentation. But this case is interesting because it shows. Sometimes some company, they sell this uh, uh, titanium membrane that you can use for the buckle to protect from the pressure. And it also gave us some very interesting result, as you can see, the two month reopening when we remove uh, this uh, titanium mesh. This case, extraction of the tooth, place the implant. Look how we packed the pure go sticky bone onto the side, cover the implant. Then we use a PRF membrane. You can see there's a beautiful membrane. Look at the healing after 1.5 months. What's the message of this? When I open a flap after 1.5 months, not even two months, 1.5 months, I open a flap, I see the, bone, the implant is covered by the bone. I don't see almost any granules anymore. I don't see inflammatory tissue. I don't see fibrotic tissue. It means we're doing the good surgery, the good biomaterial, the good approach, the good suturing technique because the nature is telling us it worked beautifully. And so it's always a nice feeling and you know it that you have to dig 
the bone that you regenerated to find your implant to place the healing screw, uh, healing screw after only 1.5 months. Let's talk now some more serious augmentation and little by little we will go towards a stronger and stronger augmentation. So let's do a horizontal augmentation on that patient. She's a young lady, she lost her central incisor, it was a trauma. What you see is uh, you're lacking buccal bone, but you're also lacking palatal bone. How complex it is to regenerate this bone buccally and palatally. You can use the membrane, quite difficult. Uh, you can uh, use the um, bone plates, wonderful for the result, but also it takes a lot of time, it's technically demanding. So see how we place two screws. Look at the angulation of the screw, 45 degrees for the buccal, same thing for the palatal, just to maintain a space that is free from pressure. So the area is grafted with pure bone, and sticky bone, and it's covered by PRF membranes, as you can see here. Look after three months. Look at the health of the bone. Look at the volume of the bone. And so after three months, in such a complex uh, situation that we started, especially on a young lady with high aesthetic demand, how we are able in three months with a very simple approach, but simple but biological approach, we are able to regenerate this bone. And because uh, we follow biology, we follow Joseph Choucron, we are able to get in three months a perfect, nice looking bone. Look at the health of this bone. Now let's talk about horizontal augmentation in the posterior mandible using screws. How do you place the screw? Like this? No. Remember, you draw the lines. This is how you make your, your plan for the surgery. And this is how you want to place the screw. Because in this area, this is where the head of the screw needs to be placed because this is in this area that there is going to be the most pressure from the flap, from the soft tissue. So we place four screws in the buckle with a 45 degree angulation. We pack a sticky bone pure go. We pack it quite densely onto the side. And this is the result after three months again. Yes, it became our standard for reopening. We have decreased dramatically uh, the healing time of the bone because it's not necessary to wait more. So after three months, we place the two implant but it's not finished. Let me show you how we handle some more. After three months, we reopen and we place the two implants. Okay, that's just what I just showed you on the previous slide. After we place the two implants, we made a sticky bone layer. It is a very thin sticky bone. We put PRF membranes and we do not close. What is the purpose of doing this when we place the implant? Because some people teach to make a graft, place the implant, and completely bury the implant into the bone graft. Does it make sense? Yes, of course, biologically it makes sense. But what if, when you place the implant, you make a small sticky bone layer, you cover it with PRF membranes, you don't close. What is going to happen is, you are going to build some bone, probably over the implant, but also here, you're going to have a secondary intention healing. So you're going to help to have thick, soft tissue for your patient. And so two months after, this is the uncovering. See how the two implants, look at the bone, how healthy it is, how the bone is covering the implant, how we need to remove the bone, the excess bone from the healing screw of the implant. It's always a nice feeling, we all know this. But look also at the soft tissue thickness. So, by doing the micro sticky, the sticky bone layer, and the PRF membranes, by not closing completely, we've increased the thickness of the soft tissue. And we know it is a critical step in the, um, in the aging process of the bone around the, the implant. Let's talk now vertical augmentation, posterior mandible using a titanium mesh, so a fast system like we showed uh, in the first few slides of this uh, presentation. So this is the case. This case is, uh, is quite frequent now in our, in our practice. This is how we treat them. We used to treat them 
with a big uh, autogenous harvesting. It's not the case anymore. We treat them by using the uh, fast system, the titanium mesh. So we adjust it, like I explained before. It goes from the bone of the height of bone of the last tooth to the bone of the uh, ascending ramus. Because it's a long span, there is three screws in that case to increase the stiffness of the mesh. It is very important. So clinical picture, you see the screw here at the height of bone of the last tooth. It goes all the way to the ascending ramus. Pack the biomaterial, cover with uh, PRF membranes, and look at the result uh, after four months for that case. Look how, by just protecting from the vertical pressure, we are able to regenerate vertically and horizontally. It's all a matter of biologic understanding. So we start from there, and we reach to that point where we can place the three implants at that time. Another case. The most frequent consultation in my practice today, uh, dear colleagues, is periimplantitis. She's a 45 years old young woman. She's had implants now 25 or around when she was 30, 25, 30 years old. She lost the bone, she lost the implant, now it's a bone disaster. So let me show you how we handle her. Same rules. Adjust the T-mesh the at the height of bone of the last tooth. Then go to the ascending ramus. It's not a very long T-mesh, so two screws are necessary in that case. You don't need to place a third screw to increase the stiffness. Look at the sticky bone. Look how convenient it is to use a sticky bone. Yes, biologically it makes sense, you decrease the space, remember the competition with the connective cells, but look, you do not have the granules going everywhere, especially in the lingual flap or in the floor of the mouth. All the granules, they are bound next to each other, so it, it is also, for the clinical part, convenient to use. The PRF membranes, we always cover our cases with PRF membranes. And look at the suturing technique. So we have one apical mattress here around the tooth. One apical mattress here, one apical mattress here. It is very important to make an apical mattress around the last tooth because it is going to bring the flap perfectly around the tooth. So it is going to be completely uh, well, watertight. I would say it's going to be perfectly adjusted. The flap will be perfectly adjusted to the to the shape of the tooth. So, so doing this apical mattress here around the last tooth is very important, and it, it is um, something not to forget. This is the healing after ten days. Look how wonderful it is, and this picture shows why we're using uh, resolvable monofilament because we do not want to go there and have to remove the sutures. Look at the scan after two months. See again, by building vertically, by protecting from the vertical pressure, we're able to regenerate vertically and also horizontally. This is the situation after uh, three months. This is the reopening, this is the placement of the implant, and uh, if you take a closer look around the implant, there is another drilling, and Joseph's been talking about it. We do not want to hurt or to compress the bone with the implant. We do not want to damage or destroy the bone that we've been fighting for, for its uh, regeneration at the stage that we place the implant. So we do another drilling around the neck of the implant. What is the pur purpose of this? Decrease the torque, one point. Second point is because there is going to be a blood clot around the neck of the implant, so you're going to have new bone. So in this area, which is the most critical part of the implant, this is the most critical part because this is where the bone loss starts, you don't even have grafted bone. What you have is new bone. That is going to make a circle around the implant to protect it. And I'm happy to show you the result after four years. You see. You can appreciate the stability of the bone and also the stability of the soft tissue for, for this patient. She's so happy. And we are very happy too, of course. Another vertical uh, in posterior mandible to show you uh, even more extreme because uh, now the 
mandibular, uh, mandibular canal is almost uh, on the crest, as you can see uh, here. So it's a quite a strong uh, regeneration, plus we have an implant here. So it's not the ideal, ideal uh, clinical situation to do a vertical augmentation in, in posterior uh, mandible. So here is how we, uh, how we did the job. We uh, adjusted the mesh here at the height of the bone of the, the last implant. Then we, the mesh goes to the ascending part of the ramus. You can see the release of the lingual flap here. You can see there is almost no bleeding. Remember the soft brushing instruments, they are non-cutting. So this means that uh, you should not have any bleeding when you are uh, using them. This is the situation after three months. Again, demonstration of if you in posterior mandible, if you protect from the vertical pressure, you are going to regenerate vertically and uh, horizontally. And uh, look at the width of the look at the width and the height of the bone that we are able to regenerate by using a sticky bone of uh, pure gold. And this is the the implant placement after three months after vertical augmentation in posterior mandible. Another case. And uh, same philosophy, adjust to the height of the last tooth. One screw, two screw, to make sure it is uh, stiff enough. Protect from vertical pressure. Again, um, technical note, here it is more on the lingual side of the mandible, but on the posterior part, it is more on the buccal. So it is uh, orient the mesh, the T-mesh is orientated from lingual towards the tooth, towards buccal in the most posterior um, area. So start there, compact sticky bone of Purgo. We uh, used the um, PRF membranes and look at the healing after two months. We decreased the healing time. Why? Because it's enough. We don't need to wait more. The C CBCT scan shows a perfect healing, then there is no need to wait more. And uh, uh, two months we reopen, you can see the, the augmented ridge. This is the video of the uh, augmented ridge. So it's probably not the best uh, video we shot, but the access was quite difficult. But in the end, it shows that after two months, when you remove the mesh and you respect the biology and you respect osteoimmunology, you are able to recreate vertically uh, bone in posterior mandible. And you certainly don't need to wait six months, nine months, 12 months to uh, to have a bone reconstruction uh, in vertical uh, direction. One more to show you vertical augmentation. I told you we usually use um, the titanium mesh for vertical, but uh, in the, her case, there was also quite a horizontal defect here in the most anterior part. So we combine it also with a screw. This is something that you can do. We can grow bone vertically and horizontally by just using a mesh, but it, in nowhere it is a mistake to add a screw into the buckle. What's interesting in that case, look after seven weeks, again, we decreased the healing time. We have a total absence of fibrotic tissue in the graft. Look after seven weeks, the reopening, the removal of the titanium mesh. Look how the health of the bone after seven weeks only. And uh, you can see on this video how easy it is to remove the titanium mesh. So basically what we do is we take a 15 blade and we squeeze the 15 blade just beneath the titanium mesh. And we are able to uh, detach the titanium mesh from the bone. In seven weeks, the titanium mesh comes in uh, 30 seconds, as uh, you can see uh, in that particular case. Let's talk vertical in anterior maxilla because we always have in mind that the most difficult is to grow bone in posterior mandible, is to grow bone vertically in posterior mandible. It's not always true. Uh, those who do uh, vertical augmentation in daily basis like we do, we know that the anterior maxilla is very challenging. So let me show you a case that we did by just using screw. Look how the bone is missing completely vertically. There is a gap. There is a, there is a hole here around this... Uh, these two teeth. So we place two screws to protect from the vertical pressure in the anterior maxilla. So this is the start. You can see we pack the, the pure gold. That particular case was a case 
was in the beginning, so it was 50% pure growth, 50% allograft. You can see uh, some uh, granules here of uh, allograft mixed with the pure growth. This is in a sticky bone uh, form, and this is after three months. Look how healthy the bone is after three months. How happy we are to remove the screw, to elevate the flap, and to find, to meet a bone like this, where you have the volume and you have the health. Because you can tell your bone regeneration is healthy by just lifting the flap. It's dense, it's homogeneous, there is no fibrotic tissue, there is no, obviously, there is no pus, there is no inflammatory tissue. But sometimes it's even more challenging in vertical augmentation, in anterior uh, maxilla, for instance, uh, that patient where uh, we cannot place only two screws. And let me explain to you why. In this particular case, there is no bone here going to the, going to the nasopalatine canal. So there is no way to place a screw here. So what we did is somehow a curry approach, a shell technique. We placed two screws with a T-mesh on the buckle. I could manage to place one screw here to be able to stabilize the mesh for the uh, occlusal part. And also there is a small T-mesh for the palatal part. Grafted with pure go, 100%, sticky bone. And uh, look at the CBCT, the control scan. Look how healthy. We know from the CBCT that the result is going to be nice because, look, there is a line here. It's homogeneous. There is no uh, up and down in the bone. It is completely regular. It's not irregular. And this is what we are searching for uh, after four weeks. When we control the patient, we take a CBCT after four weeks. And we want to control that the bone uh, regeneration, the bone graft we did, is uh, linear, that it doesn't have irregularities, because this is usually a bad sign. And this is after nine weeks. So after nine weeks, we reopen, we remove the screws, the, the T-mesh. Look, after nine weeks, how uh, easy it is to remove the screws. Because I insist on this because uh, we don't meet in person, so for the question is difficult and usually the people ask us, after this big augmentation, how difficult it is to remove the screws and the mesh, well, look, it is very easy to remove the screws, it takes uh, probably uh, five minutes to remove uh, everything. And again, take the blade, go underneath the T-mesh, separate the T-mesh from the bone and this is, uh, this is it. And same thing for the palatal uh, mesh. So, let's take a look. At nine weeks, look how homogeneous is the bone. Look how, how it looks nice. Nine weeks. Then we make another pure go, a sticky layer. Like I told you before, we make a very thin layer of uh, sticky bone to cover the implant. And we put the PRF membranes with, without closure. So we are not, uh, again, into the um, idea of uh, making bone. We are into the idea by doing this of, yes, somehow increase the bone, but most importantly, thicken the soft tissue for the aging of the, of the implant and the bone graft around the implant. So at nine weeks, you are there. You are able to place the two implants, and the story needs to be continued for that case. Now we have a full maxilla augmentation and Joseph has been uh, showing you this case and showing you the histology. I would like to show you some uh, clinical details. Uh, so we need to do vertical augmentation in the posterior maxilla, both sides. And for the horizontal, it's going to be a horizontal uh, bone grafting. So we adjust the two T-mesh in the posterior area. You can see how much bone is missing vertically. This case was grafted with a pure go, it was uh, some time ago, grafted with pure go mixed with allograft in a sticky bone uh, form. And uh, this is how we uh, manage the case. Look at 4.5 months after. Look, 4.5 months after when we remove the titanium mesh. Look how this looks like. Regular, homogeneous, non-inflammatory. Look at the density when we take the bone core. We showed you the bone core. Look at the density of the drilling in only 4.5 months. Uh, dear colleagues, this is pure biolo biology, nothing else. 
So this is one month post-op. I told you, we always, we systematically take a CBCT after one month. And when we see this after one month, we know we won the game. Because there is no irregularity in the bone graft. It looks nice. It doesn't look, doesn't show any sign of uh, inflammation. So a 4.5 months post-op, you've seen, we removed the titanium mesh. This is the histology. I will not com come back into the details of the histology. Joseph explained it to you, but it's very interesting that the connective tissue ratio is very low. 10% uh, in the horizontal, 20% if I remember correctly in the, um, in the vertical augmentation, 40% of a newborn, which is uh, completely comparable to the use of uh, autogenous bone. So this brings me to the first conclusion. What have we been doing for years working with Joseph uh, in using his mind, using uh, uh, my clinic? What we've been doing first, we fought dogmas. And it's very important to talk about this because uh, we were taught you can only do vertical by using autogenous bone. If you do not use autogenous bone, it's not possible. So we have fought dogmas. Then we have taught countless number of surgeons and uh, of international uh, surgeons. We have taught them less traumatic, less invasive, no morbidity of a donor site, fast surgery, fast recovery. We want to teach surgeries that when the patient comes back to you after one week or 10 days and tell you, I'm fine, it's well a little bit, but no pain, a very limited amount of pain. This is what we've been teaching. So we teach simplest, faster, probably smarter, and more predictable surgery. This is the key point. It's not doing some spectacular case and only one works. We teach and we do more predictable surgery and uh, we teach how to do them in a less traumatic and invasive way. But following our understanding, uh, we enhanced our protocols. I should say, following Joseph's understanding, to give back to Caesars what belongs to Caesars, we focus on immunology. We use immune supplementation on our cases that we, I have just shared with you today. We use immune supplementation. We want to make the patient in a condition that is going to be, give us a perfect healing. The healing comes from the immune response. It must be under control. The strategic antibiotherapy, um, because of COVID, thanks to COVID, thanks to Joseph's understanding, uh, we are using uh, azithromycin and it provides us uh, amazing results. Also the use of non-inflammatory biomaterial. If you use a biomaterial that each time you reopen, there is, you meet fibrotic tissue, you meet inflammatory tissue, then there is a problem. You have to change. So we are using a non-inflammatory and we are very happy to use uh, pure go for our uh, bone augmentation cases. Then we focus on bone graft preparation. There is sticky bone, first generation, second generation, third generation. Now Joseph is focusing on fourth uh, generation each time, every day, waking up, trying to improve the protocol of the sticky bone to make the life of the surgeon easier. And also for the patient, so they have faster surgery, more predictable surgery. So osteoimmunology, yes, it has a major impact on bone healing and osteointegration that makes no doubt that contamination and inflammation play a key role. So we understood that supplementation is a game changer making the condition of the immune system of our patient to heal perfectly well, to be able to accept a regenerative surgery. And also using an antibiotic with an immune effect is completely mandatory. One question still remains, dear colleagues, it's the speed. You've seen through this presentation that the reopening time is decreasing from one case to another. We go for four months, three months, two months, seven weeks. So what about the speed? Let me show you a case. This is our latest case. The management of serious uh, bone loss. So big defect goes almost to the alveolar canal. Clinically, all the buccal bone on 15 millimeter is, uh, has disappeared. So we extract the tooth, sticky bone pure go, PRF membrane, that's it. This is the CBCT at D0, the day of surgery. 
This is after four weeks. And when you see a CBCT scan after four weeks like this, it looks ready. So this is what we did. This is the reopening and this is the drilling after four weeks in a site that was grafted with a pure gold, a sticky bone on a patient that is supplemented with an immune supplement that has the azithromycin. This is the picture of the implant that was placed and this is the CBCT that is immediately uh, post-operatory after four weeks only. So this brings me to the second conclusion. So yes, the speed, you understood, the speed works. We are able to decrease the, the, the healing time, the healing period, but most importantly, it's not the speed that is important. What is most important? The most important is to understand that it's not so difficult to achieve predictable results. Our patients, they want a guaranteed result now. It's not like they come and they say, if it works, if it doesn't work, no. Patient today, they want a guaranteed result and we have the solution. The solution is osteoimmunology combined with non-inflammatory biomaterial and also the uh, over concept. Dear colleagues, I would like to thank you very, very much for your attention. Uh, hopefully someday we can uh, travel and meet uh, each other in person. That would be my great pleasure. Again, thank you everyone. Thank you PureGo also for all this organization. Thank you Joseph, Alain, Elisa, Maximia, all the team here um, in Nice. They are always making a fantastic job. It's a real great pleasure to work with these people. Thank you.